Thanks, Phil. Uh, we're going to switch things up here a little bit because really up until this point in the, in the workshop, everything's been rather top down. And what we want to encourage here is a real bottom-up approach because we don't have the answers for you today, but we have lots of questions to pose to you as the community to help us come up with some better solutions for training. So I want to lay down some ground rules, basically, and, and give you a framework for the context of what we'd like to talk about in the next uh, little while here. We, as I said, would like to offer a facilitated discussion and bring as many of you as possible up to the microphone. And we'd like you to look at training in a much, much wider context. You know, specifically, I don't want you to be picking on one agency or another. That's not what this is about. This is really about just training and about our, our retention of information as divers and the culture of rebreather diving. Uh, yesterday, Mike Menduno sort of opened us with thinking about our, agent, or our, our industry as having reached adulthood. Well, I would say that in many ways we're still in our infancy because we're still revisiting things that we identified at Rebreather Forum 2.0, and, and not a lot of that has changed. So I'd like us to, to revisit if indeed up to 20 people a year are diving on rebreathers in our community, and a lot of those factors that are killing them seem to be human-generated causes as opposed to equipment issues, then obviously the status quo is not working. So I don't want to point fingers today. I want everybody to have an open mind and, and look at some possible solutions about learning, retention, and the complacency curve. So again, just to further the context in the last couple of days, Andrew Falk brought to our attention many different studies, including things such as the Diver Mole Survey of 2002 that identified that high-risk behaviors does indeed lead to a very high percentage of deaths. Uh, the decisions made by divers may have reflected the fact that in a very stressful moment, they might not have had a good understanding of either physics or physiology, or perhaps a lack of practice and make the right decision. Um, David Kincannon, um, urged us to look at the underlying triggers, and those triggers being behaviors or choices as opposed to equipment. So can training be improved to shift the emphasis on a, a different human-machine interface? How does that differ in recreational versus technical diving? Is automation important to us, or can we train these behaviors out of divers? Bill Stone brought to our attention some very interesting things as well, such as the aviation fatalities um, statistics, looking at the fact that in aviation, when experience is gained, that seems to lessen fatalities. Clearly, that's not happening in our industry. So why are experienced divers dying on rebreathers? On his presentation, he gave us an entire list of causes, ways to die on a rebreather failure to execute, failure to de detect, failure c to conduct certain aspects. So choices and behaviors. So can those be engineered out or do they need to be taught out or are there different behaviors in training that we need to look at and focus on and improve on within our community? Bruce Par Partridge brought to our attention that the, the top uh, causes of fatalities in, in his presentation that he looked at were poor training, poor pre-dives. So those were his root causes. Even Vin Vince Ferris this afternoon looked at his NED investigations and, and tagged a large proportion of those to have human factors. And so that's what we want to focus on today. Our goals are to try and build consensus within this room and perhaps some recommendations for the future on how to move forward. And our focus areas that we're going to look at are four. First, the CCR culture. Secondly, standards. Third, instructor-specific issues. And fourth, the legal ramifications of some of those issues. The way we're going to do this is introduce a topic area, pose some potential questions for you as the audience, and then invite you to come and, and uh, comment. And when you do, please come to these microphones Get your lips really close to it and speak slowly and clearly so that our stenographer can get every little detail. We would like to limit your comments to about 90 seconds per speaker and invite as many speakers as possible to give your opinions. So no hogging the mic. So topic one, the culture of rebreather diving. So as I mentioned, Andrew brought to our attention that 
experienced divers, knowledgeable divers, often have poor risk management decisions and that complacency is creeping into our behaviors somehow. So how do we change that culture of rebreather diving to increase the emphasis on checklists? Should a greater focus on accountability be required on using pre-dive checklists and training? And how do we make that happen? Should manufacturers be shipping a checklist logbook with the purchase of a unit? Should those checklists be used for proof of currency of an instructor for their renewal or a student prerequisite for higher levels of training? Should agencies add a CCR educational component at all their levels of training, right from entry level open circuit? Here's what a responsible CCR diver looks like. Here's how you behave when you're on a dive boat with them. Here's what you should expect from them as your diving partner or as someone else that's on the boat. Should we place a greater focus on that buddy interaction and responsibility in a rebreather class? So let me open the microphone and please invite as many of you as possible to come up and make some comments on how we might change the culture of rebreather diving. Do you want to add anything? Well, while we're, while we're waiting for the mass of lining up, now remember in the previous uh, times that we've gathered together, okay, it was uh, contentious at times, but uh, a lot of stuff can come out of that. And this has been a pretty quiet group. I don't know whether the, the fact that we're all aging <laughs> they were not as, not as uh, upset about things as we used to, but pick one of these topics that, that means something to you. I mean, come on, guys, we're all the rebreather culture. I mean, think about it. I, I, I remember at the Key West Swim School, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I did a topic on technical diving then and now, and we showed the difference between, you know, Tom Mount, Hal Watts, and all the early types doing their early technical dives with what was then becoming what we thought was an off-the-shelf diver. Oh my gosh, you don't have to make your own reels anymore. Oh my gosh, you don't have to, you know, purchase a, you, you don't have to make your own light. And is that happening in, in diving? I guarantee you everybody in this room that's been on the loop of a rebreather has seen something that made them think down inside, like, what's going on? Why isn't it the way it used to be? Because it, when I learned rebreathers, I learned it from the military, so. Yeah, uh, Dale Bledsoe. Part of the culture problem, I think, is it's, it's always stressed towards the technical aspect. The real market, I think, in the future is really going to be uh, the recreational rebreather diver and get rid of this macho, testosterone-based feeling that you've got to go deeper and farther, and it just that's just my opinion, but that's what I've seen. And actually, this forum, that's the impression I've got, is we still are really pressing technical aspects of rebreathers that really aren't for the recreational realm, but for the technical realm. Thanks, Dale. I, I think that's a really good observation because th there really are two camps here, and perhaps everybody that, that makes a comment today can, can specify um, whether this is directed towards the recreational tech or technical market. Because obviously the training um, situation is very, very different for the recreational diver as opposed to the CC, or technical CCR diver that has to be trained in many, many different options and behaviors uh, to react to a situation and potentially stay on the loop. So that's a good observation. One of the other things too that I want to add, and I'm, I'm going to get myself in all kinds of trouble politically and, and professionally with this one, but I put this out to all of my students, and I don't mean this in a racially motivated thing, but what, as a technical diver I see, and having trained technical divers for several decades now, is that we're kind of the, the ultimate geeky white man sport. Okay, if any of us had any true athletic ability, we'd be playing baseball in the major leagues and pitching that no-hitter, or rocking one over the fence in the bottom of the ninth. I myself pictured myself doing the Dwight Clark catch many times as a young kid, but you know what, nature cheated me. I tried to trade bodies with Bill Stone, but it wouldn't work. So the situation is, now we're dealing, we're sitting in a room with the apex of that pyramid. I mean, we are the tip of the iceberg now because now we have an older population, because face it, 19, 20 year old divers are not out there buying seven, $8,000 rib breathers, okay? And so now we have confident, fairly financially secure people purchasing these things. And these are alpha personality types that aren't really used to being told what to do. And so it's, uh, it's almost like being in a Republican, Republican convention. Now remember, I, I ran for Congress as a Republican, so I'm, I'm, I'm teasing myself. But the situation here is we have a bunch of rugged individualists, and what we need to come, come away from this session or other sessions is, 
Let's come up with some ideas on, on what we can do. And like I said, if we don't address the culture of rebreather diving, of, of what makes us do these things, exactly like he said. Because on one end, we're sitting there touting the exploits of, of people that have done some pretty wild things on this. And then on the other, we're sitting here and not a lot of recreational stuff, even the titles of, of stuff, this versus that. Pete, jump in there. Quietly, patiently. Uh, Pete Misley, Auckland, New Zealand. Just from a, uh, a cultural um, side of the rebreather fraternity in the world, uh, coming from an instructional background, I think um, it's our obligation as instructors and instructor trainers to lead from the top. And if, if, if we're doing what we say, what we're meant to be teaching that we're doing, if we're doing that 100% of the time, then all that can happen is positivity down through the ranks, down to our students. And if they see us doing it on the course, not only on the course, but every single time we're out diving, we are following the procedures and not breaking our own rules. I think there is a glimmer of hope. Thanks, Pete. I Thanks. think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's leadership. And, and uh, there have been many analogies to the aviation industry made this, this weekend. And I've heard people say you can't make people do this. Well, apparently you can because in aviation, people buy expensive airplanes and they still have to have a mandatory number of takeoffs and landings each year. And, and stay up on their paperwork and their checklists in order to maintain their pilot's license. I don't want to see that legislated. I want to see it come from a groundswell of community support from us. Well, one, one real quick thing. The other thing, too, is now I straddle kind of a unique situation. I started off diving as a civilian as a young man taught by an old Navy SAR swimmer, my uncle. Then I went into the special operations field in the Navy, did four years there, got out of that, got heavily into technical stuff. with. Michael Menduno early on, and, and Billy Deans is the, the guy that hooked me up. And then went back into the military again after 9-11, not in the dive end at all. I went back in as a military intelligence guy, even switched services, and got sucked back into military diving. Now I'm the commanding officer of the 627th Heavy Dive Team, an Army asset. And let me tell you, checklists are amazing. And unless we as a group want to have that, because I remember when we were arguing the scientific diving exemption way back when at AAUS. And that was a huge issue with Billy. But the, the amazing thing is, unless we want a systems-based approach foisted on us, I strongly suggest we come up with some, uh, some guidelines again. Now, I've got a, 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 um, Renee out in front here. She's a skydiver. We, we you know, have jumped together on occasion. USPA is another analogy to the flight, to the FAA. Bottom line is rebreather divers are not dropping out of the skies, landing on people. If we were, if every time a rebreather diver cratered, cacked, or whatever term we want to use, and then they jeopardized other people, there'd be legislation all over us. Okay, we're worried about losing dive sites and, and, and you know, credibility in the industry. But the situation being is, it, there's a time for a systems-based approach, like you see in the military, that dive supervisor up on top, running everything. That's why we can take a nine or 10 hour bottom time diver and do some pretty amazing things. Brain is on the top, muscle on the bottom, okay? But you see, on the, as these projects get more complex, they default back to that situation because so many things need to be thought of. So if we can interject a little bit, my dive soup book and my checklist, into the examples for regular rebreather divers, I think we need to. So. Tony Howard from England. I'd like to actually be a little bit controversial because I, I, I think we've used the word complacency with divers and I think that in a lot of cases that's not the case. And I'd also like to take a small issue with one of the uh, positions that was taken recently or mentioned relate, relating to delivering air training, pilot training, and diver training. You take someone through to pilot training, you know, flying a, a paper airplane in an office doesn't count. You know, they, you're taking it from scratch. They've never done it before unless they've done a, you know, maybe a trial, but they've never gone in the, the cockpit of an aircraft, grabbed hold of the controls, and done it off their own bat. They can't do it, they're not allowed to. No one's gonna hire them an aircraft, and unless they've got several million dollars, they can't just walk out and buy one. Not the case with diving. Divers can go into a store, buy the gear, no one's gonna ask for a certification, or most stores don't ask for it, if you wanna just go buy some cylinders, and some regs, and a suit, and they can jump in the ocean and kill themselves, whether it be open circuit, or closed circuit. It makes no difference. We also have another issue with, with closed circuit diving or any rebreather diving, any technical diving to be pre uh, actually the case, because our demographic is not to take someone off the street who's never dived and stick them on a rebreather. 
These guys are mostly people who have done years of open circuit diving. Their mentality, their muscle, men, muscle training, all their drills are all based around open circuit diving. And if they've been a diver for years, okay, they're going to do the course, and most of them will get through the course because they understand the physics of diving, they understand partial pressures. Most of them have done all the nitrox courses, and many of them are trimix qualified as well. Fine, that's all well and good. But when shit hits the fan underwater, old habits come back. If they haven't done hundreds of hours of diving on rebreathers and forgotten and, and not done a single open circuit dive in that time and learnt rebreathers really, they're going to go back to previous diving practices. And that's not a fault of them, that's partly our fault. Because if you take someone who's never dived before, it's probably easier to train them and get them into the right practices from day one than build into someone who's got years of experience and putting them in a, on a rebreather and tell them you've got to forget everything you've learned before. Well, and, and that's, uh, I know, a challenge for, for everybody so that, that teaches is this word. stuff. And as far as training goes, we as instructors, or any of us here who are instructors, we've actually got a bigger task to do with experienced divers than we have with non-experienced divers. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's half the time, and I'm looking at five people all nodding and, and agreeing with us, but it is. I mean, that's the thing. If there's a mantra that I, I have when I teach a, a, a closed circuit class, it's this isn't open circuit scuba anymore from the way they act, from the way they handle the equipment. I understand rebreathers are becoming far more, more robust, but I mean, come on, we've all been there. I'm still diving my, what, I guess we're referring it to it as a generation one prism. Oh my gosh, you don't take that thing and throw it in the back of my S10 and bounce down a, a country road with it like you can a set of doubles. So, I mean, it, it starts everything from, you know, coming at it from the tactical aspect where I first learned rebreathers, mouthpiece discipline. You know, but yet I can't stand at the bank of Jenny Springs and, and yell at somebody, you off gas or you know you're going to die. I mean, it just doesn't work. So, you know. Uh, Paul Haynes, uh, UK. There are, there are two groups that uh, need to be influenced, really. There's, there's the old and bold, which is a hard job. And then there's the future generation, which are going to be your future recreational divers. And I think the general consensus here is that checklists are extremely important. But who sees that checklist? Just the diver. Now, taking a leaf out of a, a military training regime or operational regime, that checklist then gets signed off, prepared by the diver, and then signed off by the supervisor. He goes through it, and his, it's his job to make sure that, that the checklist is signed off appropriately. Now, at the end of the day, you can just tick boxes. You can't do much about that. So trying to migrate that into the recreational diving world, influence a new to try and influence a new generation of divers, do we, do we present the, checkbook, the checklist to each other as, as buddies and go through it? Do we ask the checklist to be presented to the dive boat, the dive, dive manager, the dive uh, master? It's just trying, how do we elevate the importance of this piece of paper? You know, here's mine from the other day. I'm the only person who's ever seen that. How do we ele elevate the importance of this within the whole system of pre-dive preparation? And it's j I'm just throwing it out there. Do we sign off on each other's checklists? I don't know. How do you teach that, Jill? Do you have your well, buddies? You know, that's, a, that's a really good observation. And, and I'll admit that certainly some of the SOPs that we use on, on expeditions are more stringent than we use in our day-to-day -day diving. Should they be? No. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, that is a cultural change. And, and you know, I rem I'm remembering back to a, a, a day on a dive boat where um, I had a rebreather failure just as I was standing up to get off the boat. And I just immediately sat down and said, sorry guys, I guess I'm snorkeling. And immediately all these experienced rebreather divers around me started to convince me that the problem that I was experiencing was minor and that I should jump in the water and just run the unit manually and it would be just fine. And I looked at all of my colleagues and friends and I said, boy, if there's one thing you're going to learn from me, it's I don't jump in the water with something that's already broken. And I now reflect back on that day that was five or six years ago, and two of the people on that boat are dead. So I, I think we have to stand up and say something. I think we do have to stand up and say, gosh, aren't you using a checklist? Um, and encouraging that behavior with our buddies somehow. Perhaps uh, it should be the instructor's responsibility to train it to sign off on those checklists. And that then, and plus getting the buddies to sign off on them. So that in, in induces this, this process of you know, checking each other yeah. and elevate, elevating the importance of checklists and the I responsibility agree. to each other. 
one of know. the other paradigms too I think we might need to examine in our in our hearts is I mean you saw the NPS approach hey you know what we've invested this money we're diving it and I think that's a incredible idea from a mission-oriented professional team let's get as much time on these units as humanly possible let's develop those muscle memory skills and all that so no matter whether it's 15 feet on the Arizona like you said or 300 feet on a, on a deep coral reef they're developing those skills and that's great but one of the tragic things is when I finally held my own rebreather in my hands of course like all of us in this room I would imagine or maybe I'm the only geeky one but I wanted to use that thing everywhere I mean, I remember when a dive, my first dive computer came out, I sat there in front of a TV and, and was playing with it. But I wanted to use that everywhere, and it was a painful lesson for me to learn that, wow, you know, to do this correctly, this takes a lot more time than open circuit. And this takes uh, a lot more uh, of a footprint depending on where you're going. I mean, bottom line, my prism is, is not going to fit in certain areas of, say, Rock Springs, which is 15 miles from here. And so... You know, I, I want to I use my rebreather because it's far more efficient, but sometimes it's just not the right tool. And maybe we need to get into that thing that this isn't just another tool. It's not a, a platform of diving that makes us better than other people or, or you know, uh, you know it, it's a great tool for its niche, but not for everywhere, maybe. Let's jump over here. Hi, Gareth Locke. I've got a question. We've talked about collection of data, and it's really important. And, and now the, there's a series of Dan non-fatal incident reporting systems here. I would look out to the audience and say pretty much everybody's had a, uh, a safety compromise event which other people could learn from. And that culture of reporting needs to be driven in from the agencies as well. Um, and again, lead by example. Training dives, there will be things that go wrong on those training dives. Instructors sit down, this is how you fill out the incident report for Dan, whatever, and get that information out there. And, and that needs to be driven down. Yeah, it shouldn't be everybody's dirty little secret. You're right. <laughs> there, there's been quite a few, oh, sorry, Mark Powell from the, the UK. Um, there's been quite a few comments about uh, taking military systems and military checklists and applying them to, to diving. It's not going to work. It's a different environment. I, I'd like to take a, a different approach. If you look at things like smoking uh, and drink driving, people stop doing it when it stopped being cool. And that's what we need to do. We need to make checklists. We need to make following the rules cool. You know, if you want to, if you want to get someone to use a, a checklist, get them to use the the, the Jill Heinerth checklist, the, the Richard Pyle checklist. You know, this is a cool thing to do. That's how we'll change behaviour. Yeah, well, I think that's again incumbent on all of us um, as role models to to put that out there. You're absolutely right. Hi, Ron Zelt from uh, Action Scuba. With a uh, background in education, I can tell you that if you are asked to change a program or somebody asks you to evaluate a program very much like changing the culture. It really, really has to start with the perceived need and an actual need. So if you take the data that we've all learned in the last week and say that the, the, the deaths that we've seen prove an actual need for change, we can only enact change if the perceived need for change is there. If I walk into an educational system and the data shows that the students are failing and the uh, higher-ups might say, well, you know, they had a bad exam or blah, blah, blah. The perceived need doesn't equal that. And, you, and I would say, no, I'm sorry, I just can't help you. But if we, as a group, say the perceived and actual need are there to change, that is the initiator of change. And I believe, just to e echo what was said, it really starts at the bottom. I mean, when we all started in our uh, open water class, you know, we were little sponges absorbing everything and we modeled ourselves after our instructors you know if we're taught the buddy system as an example is important and shown why what's in it for me why should I do the buddy system then I see the buddy system we will change into a buddy system if we are taught that and then we see the elite in our society diving solo it's not going to work thank you yeah sorry to uh, steal the mic again you know change and rebuild the culture um, there's been talk of um, developing rebreather clubs. Perhaps that will be a nice mechanism where perhaps the bylaws of the club mandate that checklists are important and they're signed off. Um, you know, diving with the British Tobacco Club, it is what it is, a club. And there is somebody at the surface providing top level cover. And that's a, that's a nice mechanism for, for instilling discipline. So perhaps, you know, we've spoken about developing rebreather diving clubs. Perhaps that could be a step or so towards it. Yeah. Good suggestion. Yeah, it's, it, it's kind of interesting because it, speaking as a 
I got to speak as an American. I think sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll put the blame on myself too. I mean, we're we're individualists. We sometimes really, really hate to uh, stand out, and, or I mean, excuse me, to be part of this group that's going to do something different. You know, it's like, hey, well, this is, you know, I'm going to do it my way. You go peddle your papers, and you know, so we, we need to get away from that. So, and then a question that I would have real quick is, you know, I've got a uh, I've got a six year old at home, who's uh, an in water animal today. He treaded water for 35 minutes and and was doing a, a test because he wants to learn to dive this year. Okay? And he wants to learn to dive this summer. Okay, that's a bit young. I was eight, but so I, I'm, I want honest opinion. Should I train this kid on closed circuit first, or should I train this kid on open circuit and then win? So say, say it's 12 or 13 when this happens. What do you think? I mean, this is my son. I don't want something bad to happen to him. Let's have a show of hands. Yeah, open give me a show of hands. Uh, what would, I mean, seriously, okay, he's, he's 18 years old. He comes to dad. Dad can train him either way. What, what would you do? Open circuit? Open circuit? Okay, he's a he's a baby he's a baby Terrence. Uh, <laughs> well, this yeah. kid this kid Sorry. wants to. Okay, this Gar is my son who's within the first year of his pool was taking water samples out of the pool. Gareth, look, the question was, uh -huh. what's the mindset of your son? Because that is what drives a lot of what we're doing. He is a he is a rule follower, and he is a, 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 at in what kindergarten he's reading on the fourth grade level. So he's intelligent, takes after his mom. Thanks, Evans. But, so I mean, uh, what, I mean, I'm curious. I'm, I'm honestly just doing this to spark a little debate. What, what do you think? Hands open up circuit. if you would train him open circuit first. Okay. So what do we think? Maybe 60 percent. I'm trying to be Mr. Okay. And let, let me see my brave rebreather people who would train their kid rebreather first. So all, not a few. Okay. Okay. Uh, he would be yes, yeah. So he's going to learn to snorkel and free dive for a while. Is what we're going to do. So. Richard Walker, Duke Dive Medicine. Can I answer your question with something I was going to interject anyway, if I may? In specific regard to that question, there's actually evidence as to how that probably should be done. Not from the diving world, but from other worlds. So fundamentally, there are two factors to consider with that in terms of him being new and being trained. One, who will he be around? And for the most part, when he goes on a dive boat, he's going to be around open circuit divers. And two, what modality will he depend on if his primary system fails? Mm -hmm. And that is open circuit. That's the final common bailout pathway for all technical and recreational rebreather divers with current technology. And so there's actually good evidence to indicate from other worlds that you probably should be a lot more familiar with your bailout modality, your rescue modality. And that should be something that is intuitive and second nature to you and fundamentally ingrained. Mm -hmm. This is the building of the base of the pyramid. This has been demonstrated time and time again mm -hmm. in many, many different industries. Rather than have someone who has never had real experience, not training, but experience on their bailout, their rescue, their final ditch for life, and simply has come up on closed circuit. I'm a huge closed circuit fan. Those of you who know dive with me in the past, but I'm also a big fan of the fact that when something goes wrong, and if you want to take extreme examples, three, 4,000 feet back in a cave, there's no drama for me to go back on open circuit and come out and decompress on that because it's not scary. I've done it a lot of times. Or whether you just want to say, at 12, we're on a boat with your son, and someone else has a problem, and he has to rescue him on open circuit. Either way, that should be the more familiar modality. Well, in the and so second to that, what I originally was standing up to say was, I'll be very quick. Thanks. Your checklist idea is an excellent one. And it's an excellent one not because of some of the evidence that has been presented here. For instance, from a scientific standpoint, the fact that there's never been a checklist found on a dead rebreather diver may or may not be relevant. It may be true, true, and unrelated, or it may very well be causative, as you've implied. But what is known from scientific research is that no matter how high functioning the individual or individuals may be, checklists reduce error rates. And there is evidence to support that human error is in large part causative of many of the rebreather accidents we've seen. So it is very reasonable scientifically to say this particular intervention should reduce incidents and fatalities on rebreathers. Thank My you. only encouragement to the committees thus far is that you pay close attention to that and that we not veer off like the previous lecture demonstrated into opinion and stick with what we can use as fact if this body is going to introduce its or give its blessing to
or establish precedent for uh, policy as we move forward. And remember, you, everybody out there, is this body. I'm, it's not the people up here. It's all of us. I, I'm well aware. That's why I'm emphasizing mm -hmm. it. I'm, okay, I'm going to... I'm going to cut you off just yeah. so that we have an opportunity for everyone. And I'm going to take these last two on the culture before we move into the controversial standards section. So, Martin, go ahead. Uh, Martin Sampson from uh, the UK. I'd like to add to something that Mark just said about checklists. I think checklists will work, but probably only for the first 20 or 30 dives. And it's 40, 50 dives in when the instructor's ears are not, uh, words are not ringing in their ears quite so loudly. So I come back to something that Mark Caney said earlier on, which is how much can we engineer into the rebreather so that these checks are automated. And I think for the recreational community, that's a, a more appropriate way to go. And Dick? Uh, Dick Van from Duke. Jill, if there's time and you could see a way to do it, uh, it might be nice to hear from the training agencies as to what they, how they're going to approach the, the issue of checklists in the future, whether these... Uh, should be mandatory. Okay. All right. Just just to sum up this section, and, and please, you know, as we continue, jump in with some of these these answers. Um, you know, we can't encourage enough how uh, how important it is to use these checklists to do a full and proper five minute pre breathe, and then not jump in the water with something that hasn't passed on your checklist. Those three things will probably prevent 90 to 95 percent of the accidents, incidents, and fatalities in our community. And well, it, I, maybe maybe my son does get a little bit of a rule follower from me, but you know, because I'm, I, I had a battle with Noah years ago when we wanted to start putting open circuit trimix divers on the monitor, and they they came from Dave Dinsmore was a former Army diving officer, he's the current Noah diving director, a very good friend, and taught commercial diving at FIT. Well, we ended up coming up with a hybridized system that utilized some of the important aspects that Noah and some of the commercial and Navy wanted to see to answer the, the issues, and we ended up pulling off many years, including the, the turret coming up and the engine coming up on the monitor using open circuit, and, uh, and it can work. The key to this whole thing is, and maybe this is the reason I'm up here, is I, I tend to take disparate groups of people and try to get them to work together, and that's what we need to do here, because we're gonna, we're gonna be waltzing over some topics that are gonna get some people upset, and that's not our goal, so. Why don't you jump into the standards? Okay. Introduction. All right. Well, here you have the uh, clicker. Uh oh. You're going to tell me how to use this thing, Joe? Oh. Forward. Where's my checklist? <laughs> and I, I literally did bring my checklist. So, <laughs> and guys, I, I've used I've used them on every rebreather I've done, whether military. And I started diving these things at 19. So, all right. Topic two. Here we go. Rebreather standards. Well, what we're what we're talking about. We, chicken or the egg, guys, is where is this going to come from? Is it all the agency's fault? I mean, do we, do we owe them what we do and then we, you know, respond like blind robots? I don't think so, okay? Should we demand that the training, training agencies publish their standards? Well, I was having a discussion with someone earlier and uh, I wasn't aware that I'd been violating training standards myself because that's typically something that I go over with my students. I, I did that this morning with my son. Because he says, well, I want to learn how to dive. I said, well, here's what, here's what the minimum standards you must need to do if you want this goal. And who knows? I've been a training violator for, for all these years. So that, that's an important thing. And then even something simple as names. Guys, I, I've been teaching rebreathers for a while now. I couldn't tell you all the different rebreather courses and levels that are out there right now. And I'm embarrassed to say that, but it, it's true. I mean, with all the stuff between military and this and that, it, it's a little bit difficult to get a handle on sometimes. So how can we create more informed students? And I think some, these are some things we're not suggesting. We're throwing this out, again, to stimulate discussion. Do you encourage academic-only training courses? Meaning, can somebody get on there and learn before they buy? I mean, think of how many people. All of us have seen the, the pool experiences and, and things like that. I've, been part, I've, I've helped. I've helped various manufacturers introduce their rebreathers to the public. I think it's a great way to get people excited about stuff. But holy cow. I mean, it's really difficult to talk to a, another 40, 30, 50-year-old man about the positives and the negatives of his rebreather. It's like trying to point out that someone's wife's thighs may be a little bit too big. It's just not done. Because this guy is married to this thing. Think about it, everybody. We all own rebreathers or, or have them. This is a significant personal investment. Twice what I paid for my first vehicle. Okay, What used to be a sizable down payment on a home. And yet, guess what? They all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. 
And unless we cool our jets a little bit and, and realize we're not insulting each other, and that's what's neat about the bravery shown in this room. Not only have some of you flown halfway across the world, but you've gone to significant financial uh, drain to be here and not just sit there and insult each other on a chat room. And it's this face-to-face -face stuff that's going to get stuff done, I believe. So what do we do on this? Okay, so think of these things. Right? Should the rebreather industry, okay, which means the manufacturers, us, the training agencies, create more stringent guidelines for the training of rebreather divers? And that's, you know, we're going to discuss legalities here in a little bit because none of these facets of this puzzle operate on their own. They don't exist in a vacuum. And then what do issue, what issues are we facing in recreational CCR training? I mean, we've already started to mention some. Mr. Bazanik and his panel mentioned a bunch. That's, I actually called him Mr. Bazanik. He did. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, okay, we've already kind of started to try this little uh, uh, rock down the hill. Can new divers effectively learn CCRs without open circuit training? Is that a route that the, uh, that the agencies are going to, to take? Think about it. Then they know nothing but checklists. And I'm not advocating either way, okay? I'm probably an old-fashioned guy. I, I, I tend to, to be open circuit. And that's why I brought up those presentations earlier. Because you have people at 300 feet on rebreathers nowadays that plain and simple have no reason to be there. Bottom line, once that 12 cubic foot cylinder goes away, Oh, gee, it is 300 feet deep. And unless they're one heck of a free diver and they can do a decompression on a breath hole, they're in a lot of trouble. I can't tell you how many times I've been past at Ginny Springs or Madison, you know, when I'm far back in a cave and there's somebody with a 12 cubic foot bailout on. It's like, give me a break. All right. And then what happens to uh, students when they go to a resort? And I think Nancy really helped out a lot on that. Okay. But is that Nancy's job? Should she be the one that, okay, let me see you set up your unit. Because I don't, you know, I don't know how folks from the UK are, but to an American boy, you, you're going to get some people that are going to get all wound up, wound up about that. So, all right, should uh, qualifications, requalifications, should min minimum annual dives be done? I have to jump a, a minimum number of times each year with the USPA to be considered active. Otherwise, I have to go through retraining. Okay, so think about these things. We need your input on this. And should resorts be coached on how to screen somebody? And again, Nancy touched on that really well. Should there be industry standard currency or a database? Well, my military unit, if I don't have my commands dives logged in what we refer to as a smooth log, and that gets reported to the Navy reporting system, we didn't dive. And guess how I can keep my guys doing that? They don't get dive pay. So, ha, 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 carrot stick, whatever you want to do it. All right? And then instructor currency we're going to discuss when we talk about instructors. So, let, let's let's have some input here, please. I know the floor it's is open, and I'd definitely like to hear from uh, the different training agencies at, at this point as well, because you know one of my sort of pet issues, I guess, is is standards and the copywritten standards, which are not allowed to be published. And I would like to see them all transparent on the internet, so that people like Nancy have the tools that she needs in order to know what this darn card means when the person gets to her resort or so that uh, I as an instructor can send the information to my, to my students um, so that they know exactly what to expect on their course before the course begins. This is, this is a first. There's only three people in this room with an opinion. Mark, why don't you jump in? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mark Kenny from Paddy. I th there were a lot of questions there. I'll address those I remember. <laughs> Regarding standards, we certainly have no secrecy concerning our standards. They're openly available apart from the fact that normally we say you have to be an instructor or, or a dive center to buy them, but we would certainly share them quite happily with other agencies if that was a, a desire, no problem at all. The question about uh, can you learn initially on a rebreather? Yes. With Paddy? Not right now. Probably we will in the future. For the time being, we've decided it's more appropriate, we think, to start off on an open circuit and then cross over to closed circuit later. But in principle, yes, why not? what you do with your son, I don't even want to advise you. Well, now that's going to become the latest chat room. Tyson wants to teach his son to dive at age four. No, guys, I, um, I obviously did that to There was a, a question from Dick earlier for the training agencies about, I think, checklists and something else, was it? Checklists. Checklists. Checklists are, are a very good thing. Uh, I think they will be essential for technical diving long into the future. Recreational diving right now, in many cases, it's the best we've got. I see a potential alternative into the future because 
with machines becoming as intelligent as they are, there are alternative approaches. For example, we know that people can be lazy, they can be distracted, they can make mistakes. An ideal scenario might be that a machine forces you to go through your checklist and doesn't allow you to dive as you would like unless you have gone through every step then there can be no question of not getting around to doing your checklist. Yet another approach is for the machine to do much of the checking for you. We need certain things to be checked, whether they are checked by a potentially unreliable person or a wholly reliable machine is another question. And this is not science fiction. Bill Stone showed us a video of a unit doing exactly that. We're not yet at the stage where it is exclusively able to do that and I'm not quite able yet to have a robot take me diving, but we are going in that direction. So I, I think we must not just always take stock of the present status quo, we must look at what we would like to see happen into the future. Thank you. Yeah, Dale Bledsoe again. As far as CCR training, I, I, I personally think that they, the, the, the CCR diver should undergo a, an intensive physics and physiology course uh, which is independent of any particular maker's or, or, or mark of rebreather. And like in flight, uh, flight training, you know, you'll learn how to fly in a plane, but you get all your theory, and it's the same theory no matter what plane you're going to fly. Uh, and then you get a, a type certification. Uh, so you get your basic CCR certification, and it may be on a, on a, on a basic unit, but the standard throughout the industry uh, should be very intensive on, on physiology and physics, as well as general uh, rebreather construction and, and, and monitoring systems. Uh, and then going from one breather to another breather would be basically a, a checkout dive and, and, and of course, a, a, a unit-specific uh, training to what's peculiar to that particular unit. That makes sense. I mean, the aviation model again comes up, so. Uh, Pete Mesley, uh, Auckland. Just to comment on the gentleman's com um, comments about um, physiology, I think it's a fantastic idea, and probably more importantly of all, to be written by the people in the audience here whose job it is to, to understand and know advanced physiology, not to be written by somebody who thinks they know a lot about physiology. So, um, yeah, uh, absolutely great idea. I've got a comment about the amount of, of input that manufacturers have in instructor and instructor level training, instructor training level programs, because um, I, for one, being an instructor trainer, would absolutely relish having more input from the manufacturers because it's right up, up the top there where they've got all the information, and what we want to avoid is the dissemination of information and it all being watered down. So we want to try and avoid the information being watered down as it goes down the levels. Um, and just. Uh, my last uh, comment is um, people's ideas on, on um, refreshers, like how long do someone be without um, being in the water? What sort of time, time frame are we looking at for someone to actually say, well, you know, you need a refresher before you get back in the water again um, after a period of time? And for me personally, uh, when someone finishes a course, they need to do as much diving as they can in a short period of time to secure the level of training and knowledge they've received and then the longer you leave it, you know, these people just, they just need help two or three, four months down the track and they, they need the retraining um, six months later, in my opinion. Thanks. Tom? Okay, several things. First thing is to approach the standards. A lot of training agencies don't put their standards on internet wide open because their lawyers have told them to take them off once they did. So this thing comes back, we are, all of us, whatever agency, we're really governed a lot by what our lawyers tell us to do. Just like the standards, we agree on standards, we produce them to our lawyers. If our lawyer feels when an accident does occur, they're legally defensible, then that can be allowed to become a standard. Mm -hmm. it can't be, sometimes it's not really the best avenue, it's the one that's legally defensible. Second thing, uh, another thing to answer Terry's question, in my particular situation, I would start my 18-year-old son on a rebreather before I would open circuit. And the reason why, because we tried and experimented with things like this. And these guys do learn open circuit. They learn rebreather much more. They seem to be a lot more conscientious as they evolve. That's a personal and, thing, and, not an agency thing. And remember for the next one of these, that's going to be one of our big questions in the future. One other thing I'd like to bring up, because I wanted to bring this out in the last presentation. 
and Jill was part of this. Uh, Paul Hennerth was part of it. Richard Powell was part of it. Many years ago, we did some testing on a system that would be on CO2. They like kind of lightly skimmed over the effect of when they're sitting at rest, breathing. To give you the idea that somebody could breathe five minutes without a canister and not go out. Well, we put them in the water. We put people, one person against the water. Here's, obviously you're gonna CO2 hit. You're on a cis cylinder, the canister is completely removed. You know you're gonna get a CO2 hit. There's no doubt. Directions, the moment you feel unusual, switch. What he lightly touched on, but he didn't call it that, the first thing that happens with any of three H's is confusion. So, if you're confused, you make bad decisions. We eventually trained a total of 100 people doing that before we were told by some medical authorities not to do it anymore, so we had to quit. <laughs> they were calling human experimentation stuff. So 90 out of 100 people were brought up right on the verge of blacking out. Just like the free dive roll. The fins start to bend, you know, we're fixing to black out, pull them up. Most of them, I got the exact figures at home, the, most of them initially said, well, I didn't feel anything unusual. As they began to get some color back in their legs and they get to where they could kind of stand up on their own, they, oh yeah, I did have some burning in my legs. I did have some shortness of breath. So I just submit to you what we got to do in all of our training is emphasize confusion more than we do a long shot. Uh, recreational diving on reef beaters, I think is a coming thing. I think it's gonna be good. And I think almost all the agencies are gonna wind up doing it because I think it's a safer route. Yeah, I think the longest anyone ever made it in that pool test, Tom, was like one minute and 15 seconds and most were blocking out at 45 seconds under high workload. That's another topic. So just out of curiosity, a show of hands, how many people, even though this could make the legal issues more difficult, how many people would like to see all standards published on the internet publicly available? Even if, it, okay, so that means that, you know, if you're sued for not doing your job as an instructor, yeah, pardon me? Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, hands Everybody up again. Get? I would say that that is the majority of the room, that even though this might make, talk to the lawyers. Well, yeah, we're going yeah, to touch on that in a legal point in anyway. The, in so. the face of that, that, yeah. that we would still like to see that in our industry. Barry, please. Hi, my name is Barry Coleman from RAID Training Agency. Um, many of the issues raised today, we've actually um, considered these. Uh, and I'm going to actually start from, we actually do rebreather training and we do open circuit training. And just to cover quite a few of the points. Um, our open circuit courses all include information about rebreather diving, such as has the guy, the, the rebreather diver completed a checklist, has he handed it in to his buddy to con confirm the checklist, and has that been handed to the dive center management or boat skipper for uh, the dive before. And they, they're actually taught that if they don't see this, not to dive with a rebreather diver. So that's just one little issue. Um, on the rebreather side, a, a gentleman just earlier mentioned about uh, detailed information about rebreather diving in general. Uh, we actually thought about this a few years ago, so we put together a complete core level of education, and uh, we looked at this education and went, wow, there's a lot of information here. How can we get this to the uh, students, uh, and how can they actually learn this without having to go to a lecture, because if the lecture had to uh, lecture all the information of, of that, that we provide, he'll be standing up there for about four days and everyone will have gone to sleep in the first hour. So we provided, we thought about it and we put it on the internet. So it re is a requirement that the student actually purchases the course, and by the way, when he purchases, when he registers on the RAID website, he can actually see our standards. So anybody who registers on the RAID website can download our standards, it's, it's, it's open to everybody to see. And they have to actually read that information about rebreather diving. We even quiz them on such things as what the skills they're going to do in confined water, what they're going to do in open water, which gives them ample time to make a decision whether they want to continue with the course and go to the practical side um, before they actually make that uh, step to go to practical training. Um, on the practical training side, we certainly uh, advocate, as Tom Mount mentioned earlier, about teaching people to dive on rebreathers from the beginning because it installs a different mindset in the diver than as somebody mentioned earlier about, you know, you put on open circuit, they get that mindset that it's quite easy, it's quite robust, and really open circuit is quite forgiving in the water. But with a rebreather, you don't have that 
type of mindset. So if we can install the correct mindset from the beginning to a diver with regards to checklists, safety, bubble checks, checking PO2s on the way down, checking with buddies PO2 set points during the dive, confirming with buddy what the set points are and actually acknowledging it, etc., etc., as we've all heard about and coming up. That is a complete mindset from the start, as opposed to trying to change that mindset from open circuit. Because remember, the first impression is always the long, long, lasting impression. Okay. The other thing that we considered was there's a lot of quality assurance programs in the market today which are uh, reactive to a situation. So we decided how can we look at quality assurance and make it proactive as opposed to reactive. And with the internet, we are being able to do that. For example, we can actually um, tag any new instructor, and if that instructor is then appointed to, to teach a student, that tagging will come up immediately on our website, on our um, main uh, computer system, that that, that instructor has been tagged to train that student. And this is worldwide. We're not just talking one country. If a guy, uh, we actually had an instance recently where a guy was uh, tagged. He, um, he was trained in Mexico, he went to the Canaries, we tagged him, and all of a sudden we found he's teaching courses in the Canary Islands. Be before he even got in the water, we had actually had contacted the dive center in, in question, made sure he was doing everything right, and we even contacted the student prior to them getting into the water and asked them questions if the instructor had done that. We had found that he hadn't done the requisites, and we stopped the course there and then. Now that's what we call proactive quality assurance. So that's just something I thought I might like yeah, to Yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up, Barry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, and I think, you know, just to help there, an interesting thing on their program is that there is an independent place on the Internet where the student says, yes, I mastered this skill, check, and then the instructor says, yes, he did actually master this skill. So it's a two-way kind of quality assurance, student to instructor, instructor to student, which is kind of interesting and innovative. Brian. Brian Carney with TDI. Just to get things rolling quick, uh, Vu, we follow a very similar process. Our, in, our standards are available to our members and facilities at any time electronically and updated. Very similar to what you've heard from two of the other organizations. And, and to the public as well? Not to the public. You give bullet lists to the public on what they can for very much what the same reasons Tom's alluding to. Bring it up with the legal people. <laughs> the other thing is, one of the things I want to address, one of the qu uh, questions, the topics that um, we've already started to work together, the training organizations. That's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, the uh, training departments most all talk to one another. So if you're an instructor and you're attempting to cross from one organization to another because you're getting in trouble with that particular organization, we're communicating with one another to find out. It's our way of policing ourselves um, and policing the industry. This has been going on for quite some time. It's one of the reasons why it led to three of the technical organizations to get together and release our numbers. Um, a what this, at this DEMA. We've had such good communication over the years that we finally decided let's just throw it out there and put it out there so everybody can have that baseline. That working together of releasing numbers is a very thing, it's a, one of the things that the training agencies hold very dear to, um, and don't release that information. As far as I know, not other than the certification census, has led us to start talking about other things and opened up lines of communication that I don't think would have existed without the going through this process. I'm happy to say that as we went through that process, other organizations have already approached us and said, we, can we participate and get involved in that group? So if there's one thing that came out of it, the training organizations are going to start to work a little bit more, um, and I commend the ones that have approached us and talked about it. Another point, we've already begun to set the basis for naming different types of naming conventions together. Our report, a basic certification is 30 meters, no decompression. An intermediate certification is lower and an advanced. That's set in our report that we just gave, and I believe we'll continue to give those numbers in the same way. So now we have some baseline for testing. Let's remember, it's all recreational unless it's scientific, military, or commercial. So it's all recreational when we talk about it. And then finally, I want to address the thing about checklists. And I think Jerry's going to talk about this in a minute. I'll put him a little bit on the online here. 
but um, it's been a topic of conversation around there. And from TDI's perspective and what we hear from our instructors well, often is what checklist do we use? A central clearinghouse for all the checklists from the manufacturers would be extremely helpful and a campaign from the training agencies to go to that clearinghouse to see all the checklists because then the students can find them there uh, really easily. We would definitely support some type of initiative like this and be very much a part of that. Thank you. Jerry. Jerry Wiley, Interspace Systems. Just a couple of quick observations. In terms of standards. Can you step uh, a little closer to the microphone, please? In terms of standards, it's, you know, the devil's in the details, but as I mentioned the other day, the recent manufacturers have committed to publishing our training standards for our specific units. These will be absolute minimum standards, and we look forward to this, uh, the training agency exceeding these standards. I think we've got a lot of things started in the last year. I think this weekend has really accelerated some of the initiatives, and I think over the course of the next year, um, I can assure you we are going to see changes in standards. We're going to see changes in the publishing of standards. And when I hear talk of we're going to do this or we're not going to do that because of lawyers, that's not the job here. The job is to put the lawyers out of business, to make this thing safe enough to where they don't have work. And that focus needs Kill to change. Kill the lawyers. <laughs> Hey, if, if, I can, if I can throw something in here, too, since we have a manufacturer's rep, and I'll make this real quick, but one of the things that we deal with a lot on the military end is obviously we deal with Kirby Morgan and, and places that, that deal with obviously commercial level, military level, surf supply systems that, you know, are you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, not big runs. And one of the things that uh, the Morgan people talk to us about is that and I'm, I'm maybe suggesting if you guys already have it, so I'm not trying to be ignorant here, but some of the manufacturers of these rebreathers may want to talk to some of the surf supply people because they, what they have done to eliminate effectively product liability nightmares is that they have developed really stringent um, manufacturer's checklists that our soldiers, our sailors are required to use. And the moment you deviate from it, they're instantly defensible from a manufacturing standpoint. We have one of the most onerous in the business. Okay, so, and like I said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one yeah. on TV, but just but a little insight there. I, I think the main thrust of where we need to, what we need to keep in mind is Brian brought up a very good point. Anything that's not scientific, military, or commercial is recreational. We need to keep that very clear, or we will be speaking with OSHA and WISHA and all the other uglies out there. And that's going to be the end of decompression diving for all of us. So it's recreational, we need to keep it that way. We all know that we need to improve. This has to be an industry of continuous improvement. We're gonna see some interesting times over the next year because we have a lot of detail work to get through, but we're extremely committed to getting through that. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Paul, I think you're next. Paul Ray Marcus. Jerry took already part of what I was going to say about uh, published standards on the website. So the RISA members, uh, manufacturers all agreed to publish their minimum training standards so that everybody can see it before even thinking of doing a course. If you go to the Revo website, there is a complete description of the minimum requirements every student will have to do during his first course, very detailed. Another topic was about checklists. There's one thing that has not yet been highlighted. We all talk about a checklist, but there is something as the art of making a good checklist. Checklists of 50 lines never work. They all throw it away. There's a lot of things uh, published, and you can easily check if you go Google or, or Wikipedia how to make good checklists that are very concentrated and that give the user a feel or a good feeling that they will dive in a safe way when they have used their checklist. That will make a difference. Yeah, I, I would agree to a point, though. I would suggest that the use of any checklist seems to be working because we're not finding the dead guys with checklists. And so, you know, certainly things that are too onerous will not work for some, but it seems to me that people are using checklists to represent a certain type of diver. Well, yeah, and, and you know, I know we've got some Cambrian people in here. I mean, guys, I, I'm assuming most of you guys are using checklists for open circuit, too. I mean, a technical diver, a expedition, I mean, whether like Jeff or, or, or Richard was talking about, holy cow, that, that's a multi-piece puzzle that you're jetting from one point of the globe to the other, and that can't be done without a manifest or a checklist. I mean, uh, you know, that's an area where I guess I'm on the far right, but uh, 
before I take a, I mean, tonight I'm loading up to teach a cavern class and I'll be doing a checklist next to my truck because I don't want to get out there and look like a moron in front of my students. I forgot my fins. And come on, we've all done it. Or am I the only moron in the room? Let the record state I'm the only moron in the room. So. Okay, Michael. Michael Mendino. I actually have two, two points, but what is the next topic area? Is Instructors that... and then legal. Good, then I'm going to save one for that oh, one. Okay, well, do you so, want me to just jump in real quick and, and, and um, throw this into the loop? Then you can answer both. But we'll add this into our, into our issues. You know, who should supervise instructors? You know, right now we have training agencies certifying instructors, but we have manufacturers going, oh my goodness, what about that guy? <laughs> How can they work together better to either potentially revoke a credential or endorse a particular instructor? Um, should they be posting a list of endorsed instructors on their, on their lists? And then the biggie, should instructors be required to prove currency um, when they're teaching an entry level class? Should they be providing a proof of logs that they're current on the particular rebreather that they're teaching on? How many rebreathers should they teach on? If they're certified in 12, are they really current and capable to teach 12 at any given time? Um, how many students should they teach per year? Uh, I think these are all issues that are worth looking at. And should there be some sort of a industry standard currency card? Should there be a rebreather pilots association where annually I submit my checklist and say, I'm a good girl, I've, here's 12 checklists from my Sentinel and I'd like a rebreather pilots association endorsement sticker for this year to say that I'm, I'm good on the Sentinel, but even though I have an Optima in my garage, I'm not good on my Optima. Uh, so should there be something like that? So jump in there, Michael. So two, two points. Um, we're talking about training standards, of course, but there's another side, which is operational standards. Uh, when I was training in tech diving with uh, Billy Deans, a Key West diver, we, we had a set of SOPs that we followed uh, for our diving. Things like, uh, certainly with rebreathers, rigging and plumbing, you know, isolator valves, uh, should you run your BOV off your diluent, should bail, you know, uh, stages, the scrubber use, uh, use of helium, solo diving, gas switches, mouthpiece straps, limits. I mean, there are a lot of issues, and I just wonder, maybe from hearing from you guys or others, just is it worthwhile developing a set of best practices that would be put out there, not, not for training, but for our dive? Well, one of the things I think we tend to gravitate towards as, a, as opera, you know, and when you talk about the operational guru, anything I've learned, I learned from Billy. And, you know, on, on expeditions, I think you've seen it echo time and time again. I think you gravitate towards it. I mean, it can become a, a you know, a, a cult following of, you know, you have to have this color tanks, this has to go there or whatever. But it can also be a, an operational thing. I have a support diver on an expedition. I want to be able to make sure that Grant's on his right gas mix. Because if he's asleep at the wheel, even on open circuit, and he switched the wrong gas, hey, whap, hey, come on, what are you doing? Oh, right. Everybody's got it on the same side. So, you know, I, I'm... I'm I'm a libertarian, I guess, in some ways. I don't want people to tell me how to dive, man, but it works. It's a proven concept, so I think that's a sound point you raised. In the military, certainly. Oh, yeah. Military is all systems-based approach, guys, because we have very inexperienced people. I got a kid that comes out of the U.S. Navy dive school. Okay, this kid can do flutter kicks with the best of them. He can do push-ups until his pecs blow up, but this kid has no clue about Boyle's Law other than he could recite it verbatim. <laughs> Okay, Archimedes principle, an object wholly partially reversed in a fluid is void up equally by the amount of object it displays. Well, okay, this kid can spit it out while doing a two mile run. But, oh my gosh, underwater, they have six to 10 hours. They're done a deep dive, 190 in a pressure pot. And I'm not, I'm not biting the hand that feeds me for heaven's sakes. I mean, it, it works because you have a crusty old nasty mean master diver up there that's seen more things than God, including chamber operations and everything that will instantly shut that kid down because they're more scared of him than they are of death in a lot of cases. So, you know, so maybe that's what you all need to become, mean, crusty old people that shut people down. Where's your checklist, boy? Hit the deck. You know, I don't know. All right. So, so second point, experience that happened to me just in when I first got my rebreathers, shopping for instructors. I guess I was asked, you know, what, what do you need to bring? And they said, well, you know, come down. Should I bring, you know, bring your wetsuit? And I said, well, actually, you know, I've just been gearing up. I, I don't own a wetsuit. I just have a, I dive a dry suit. And they said, oh, no, 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 you know, much easier to dive. It's much easier if we do this in a wetsuit. And I had multiple t people tell me this. Now that I've done, I did my course with Paul Haynes. And he said, oh, bring your dry, you've got to have your dry suit. And I realize now it's not only affecting my rigging, 
but certainly my skills. And with, if I had gone for a wetsuit course, I would have come back and had to figure all that stuff out on my own, you know, maybe done it successfully, maybe not. So I, I just wonder, group consensus, you know, may, maybe there should be some sort of thing if you're diving dry, that's how you should do your course, period. I realized that it was easier, but it was being easier for the instructor, exactly. not for me, the divers, and the students. So I just wanted to throw that out there for yeah. a commentary. You run into that as with, I mean, people call her up to, for classes or call me up for classes and, oh, we'll come down to Florida. It's like, where are you going to be diving? Well, we're from Duluth. Oh, okay, well, as much as I'm a wimp and I don't want to freeze to death, it's going to be far cheaper for you and more logistically sensible and better for your training if I come up there to you and train in your backyard because that's what you're going to be diving. You know, me taking you into Jenny Springs or, or you know, out off West Palm Beach in, in the, some case has its advantages, but face it, it doesn't, it's not a realistic analog for what you're doing and that's supposedly what we're doing training people like an astronaut through a graded series of exposures to deal with stressful and f potentially fatal situations sorry you've been waiting a long time <laughs> hi there uh paul tumor from ssi i just want to make it clear uh, about ssi standpoint really on how we are with rebreathers we're just entering into the rebreather market so it's very very exciting for us um, for recreational rebreather we've uh, allowed uh, a non-diver to enter into rebreathers, which is a hot topic, I'm sure. I'm not here to discuss really the ins and outs of it. Uh, there's a general consensus of agreement and slight disagreement, but we think that with modern electronics and everything, everything's going to be, uh, and, the, and the format of the course, we've really, we've really got it buttoned down. But a couple of things that have come out of this weekend, which have been absolutely fantastic, is we've been looking to take on technical CCR. We've looked at the formats uh, and we've listened to all the other training agencies and we've tried to establish some sort of standardization between the courses within our own agency as well. And we're thrilled with the response that we've got from all the manufacturers to our requests for personalized checklists from the manufacturer to go with our generic checklist that we're running. Not only have we asked for that as well, and we've received a, a nod from all the manufacturers have said that they will help us build an individualized skill circuit or skill set that they would like done a specific way for their rebreathers because we're also seeing issues with this. What we've also decided to do as well is that the, the standards, our standards are obviously very transparent. You can pick them up on the website quite easily and they've been there since 2007, so there's no issue with that. But what we have decided to do as well is uh, much like uh, Kevin Gurr and Phil Short have done with the Sentinel, is each diver does a, a skill sign-off as to that they have achieved those skills. We are going to do that as well with every rebreather, but we're also going to let the manufacturer have that sign-off sheet and SSI will keep the sheet as well. So we really are very, very keen on diver safety. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Gareth Locke again. It sort of sits in this because it's, it's what you're going to teach on the courses, but we've talked about automation, it's good. Aviation, it's improved things. In diving, it's improved things. But one of the things they found in aviation is that automation has potentially gone a bit too far and you're not teaching the reversionary modes. The human is always the backup for when the automation fails. So a question to the, the agencies and the, the manufacturers is how are you going to address the, as more automation comes in, dealing with complex failures that you can't necessarily hope to solve uh, straight off? Well, I think that depends on recreational or technical as well, whether the... Uh the response is simply bail out and surface. Yeah. David. Well, you can jump in. You have another oh, okay. chance. Uh, yeah, quick one. On your list of things, qualifications for instructors, Jill, uh, one thing I didn't see was how many times recently have they actually just gone diving, actually right. done the activity that they're teaching people to do, not in an instructional environment. I think that's important as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Pete, quick one. Pete, yeah, again, I've got just one question for the manufacturers. The question is, would you like to have the power to revoke an instructor's cert if they're not following safe diving procedures? That's just a... Okay, so that's one. Anybody, anybody not want to? All right, all right. Okay. So enter it into the proceedings. Enter. Leon. So that was a, a, an Leon, astounding you're yes. You're that crusty old dive soup is what the problem well, for, is. For those that don't know, Interspace Systems some years ago went, yikes, there's some really scary instructors out there. There's been some attrition of knowledge. And so Leon basically did a recall. And he said, all right, everybody has to come in for an update to make sure they're up to date with the most current operation and, and models that are out there. And, uh, and then he also, at the time, unblessed 
many instructors and, and kept a, a core group that he was comfortable with. So, and ITs. Okay, we're running low on time, so Andrew. I, yeah. uh, <clears throat> I just have a question for the floor, actually. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have a death rate somewhere between five and ten times the, rec uh, the recreational rate. And while we've had a number of good ideas put forward, we have no current evidence that any of those ideas will make any difference to that death rate. Should we, morally, be suggesting to the recreational market that they should be adopting this technology? Good question. Ooh. Given that we have a death rate some, somewhere between five and ten times the recreational rate. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. <laughs> right. And whilst we have a number of good ideas that have been put forward during the last few days on how to correct some of those things, we have no evidence that any of those ideas will make any difference to that death rate. Should we morally, therefore, be suggesting that the recreational market adopt this technology good. until we have our house in order? Rob, jump in. I, I think most of what I was going to say got said by the last three or four people, but one thing I think we need to do culturally is encourage people to go shopping for the right instructor. Where, I mean, there's a lot of good instructors out there. I think, as we all know, there's a lot of, well, not so good instructors out there. So I think it needs to be brought to people's attention. They can go shopping for an instructor instead of just taking you know, whoever's closest or whoever's cheapest or whatever. Thank you. Okay, just before Tom, I'd like a quick show of hands. How many people believe that we should have some sort of instructor currency requirement for teaching? Hands up. And how many don't think so? I don't see any hands up in the room for not having a currency requirement for instructors. So let's put that in the record. That's very interesting. Tom? Okay, a couple of things. One, I'd like to emphasize what Ryan said a while ago. There a is a the lot of communication between the Thanks. agencies now, and we do police our instructors. All of us have very strict QA programs. If we know about a problem, we have a part of them reported, we do investigate it. It sometimes takes three, four, five, and six months, and a lot of money, and a lot of back paying. And a lot of times it comes personality, sometimes it's real. Um, second thing on checklist, we've had a checklist for about five years, but it doesn't check the equip the Manufacturers just looks, it does the things a diver needs to do to get in the water, kind of like an estrial and cave diving. Mm -hmm. And we require every instructor, every course to use that. So I just want to get that in the fact that we do have our own communication systems. Let me add uh, a little wrinkle here. I want to go through our final, I'll do this real quick. And it's going to just add the legal aspect. And so I know we have some legal eagles in this room, so maybe you want to have some mic time too. But real, so, some of the things that we've been talking about, am I pushing the wrong button? I don't have my checklist. <laughs> This one. Oh, I thought it did. See, two of us. Not smart We're dead. Technology. Okay, okay, we'll just talk well, about legal. Yeah, okay, so anyway, <laughs> now, obviously you've, you've heard us all talk about it. Okay, well, we have to do this because of legality. I mean, and everybody that's an instructor from open water level up wears that hat and wears that, that blanket that they have to have on. The moment you step outside your standards, you're kind of done. So help us out. How do we integrate manufacturers? How do we integrate training agencies? And how do we integrate the legal reality that we live in that if uh, you know I knock her off the stage I'm going to get sued so something like that I mean what's gonna happen so help us out see I kill I kill any computer you've seen it here first <laughs> so so join in let's continue I actually just wanted to address Andrew Fox point is there still time to do that yeah we have about uh, yeah. probably eight minutes I would yep. imagine he, he was saying is it reasonable to introduce rebreathers for recreational divers given what we know. Uh, I would say yes it is, but within certain parameters. And if you simply said take whatever we've done in the past and just do that in the recreational field, then I would say no, that would be wrong. They need a specific program of training which is designed for the diver and a specific envelope in which to use it. So there are two major components to this. One is restricting the envelope in which this is used, the recreational envelope. No decompression, 40 meters maximum depth no overhead obstructions, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second part is to limit the demands upon the diver so they're reasonable for a recreational user. And the approach Paddy is taking with that is to define what we call the Type R rebreather, which is a machine which is relatively simple to use, uh, a sophisticated machine, but one with a, a quite easy human-machine interface. 
And with those two components combined with a, an instructional system approach, which is delivering all the critical information the student needs, we feel it is quite reasonable and valid to introduce this into the recreational realm. So that sounds like SSI and PADI are kind of in line with a... I can't really speak for SSI, but I imagine well, they have we a just, We just had him up, and so they're doing rebreathers from first moment. It's Mr. Bazanik. Oh, actually, I was just going to... Um, I'm Alex with USF. I'd like to address the topic of new divers starting on CCR. I believe, first of all, that a comprehensive course in rebreather principles and physiology would be a, an acceptable barrier for entry to kind of cut out the bottom percentage that shouldn't be driving, diving a rebreather at all. Um, in addition to this, what I think is uh, important is to remember that one training methodology does not necessarily fit all. I do not think that it is appropriate for most divers to begin on CCR. However, such individuals probably do exist, and they probably can learn to dive safely on CCR. On CCR, at the same time, they're learning open circuit. However, they are certainly rare, and I believe that a specific training methodology should be applied for these people as well. They should probably have to ask for that course, but if they do, if they're forced into another training mode, the risk is that they rush their open circuit training and they don't learn the basic skills that they should because they're rushing to get to the CCR training. I believe that such an individual could probably be able to dive safely on CCR to begin with if they were taught open circuit along with that so they didn't feel as though they were missing out on what they really wanted. Yeah, I, beneath the sea recently I did a, an eight hour workshop which was a class for people that didn't own rebreathers and it was rebreather 101 it was physics physiology basic operations um, you know how they work it was CE testing and what it means how you choose a rebreather without endorsing any one particular rebreather how you weigh your pros cons your risk management and your budget to make a good choice and it seemed to be really um, uh, people seemed to really enjoy it and felt like it gave them the better tools to make a choice on finding an instructor finding a unit that was right for them so I would encourage the agencies to consider sort of breaking that away and, and potentially offering that as a certification level that can then move on to a full rebreather class. And then we were, she and I were discussing this yesterday. I mean, one of the things that goes on in the military is if you're becoming a naval aviator, you go up and you go ahead and go through your, your basic fixed wing training at Pensacola and then depending on what uh, airframe you go to, uh, if you go to rotary wing, then you go to another training, whereas the Army requires everybody to go through rotary wing training first, and then only then can you go to fixed wing training. So we're kind of in that same situation here. I think these will be our last three. So Jeff, go ahead. All right, I'm going to talk to two issues. The first is currency. Nobody stood up to say anything against it. I'm certainly not against it either, but I am against the way it might be defined. Is currency 12 dives a month, 12 dives a year, 12 dives a decade, or 12 dives a century? You know, and those are all very different. The second part of currency deals with how much background experience the person comes from. Currency for somebody who's done one class of one student is very different from currency who's, for somebody who's done 500 students over the period of 15 years. It's, just, it's no different than somebody who just learns to open circuit dive, doesn't go diving for a year. They don't remember anything when they're done because they've forgotten everything they learned versus somebody who's done 500 dives, takes a year off, they can come back to it generally with no problems whatsoever. The second thing I want to address, I mean, I don't want to see us becoming the scuba Gestapo, I guess is where I'm at. The second thing I want to address is the concept of teaching people that have never been diving before on a rebreather. I personally have no problems with that. I've taught three students that way that had no open circuit diving experience whatsoever. One of them did fine. One of them needed a little bit of extra time, and one of them I didn't certify. And quite frankly, that's not too dissimilar from what I would have expected to have seen had they started an open circuit first. The difference is, is that the open circuit classes, the way they're structured now, typically have to be longer than they are now because you've got to cover an adequate depth, no pun intended, enough open circuit skills to be able to provide them the ability to go to back up or to bail out and get to the surface. And you also need to increase the class time and duration, contact hours, to include all of the other factors that we're presuming they come in with. For example, knowledge of waves in the environment and surf 
and hydros and all those types of things as well. So I personally have no problem with it and in fact expect to see more of that kind of activity going on and think that we ought to be encouraging it, quite frankly. Okay, please. Elaine Ferrito from Titan Rebreathers. There is quite a bit of experience in this room. I think the majority of folks that have traveled this weekend have years upon years, upon decades of diving. I'm one of the uh, lucky few that did my four open circuit dives and went straight to rebreathers. And as a current instructor for the Titan rebreather, I will say that when you first teach someone, and I, I think the instructors can attest to this too, is there's a lot of information you're throwing their way. And there's a lot to absorb. Some students learn it, no problem. Others, it's gonna take some time. I would love to see this training standards and more information available online, maybe as resources where people can look back. You have to look at future generations, I think as maybe one of the younger divers in the room. People are very visual learners. The books, the training materials, while some of it is very stimulating, I think we need to address that too for future generations of divers because that's where ultimately we're going. I mean, I know everybody wants to live forever, but as we've seen over the weekend, not everybody has. So addressing those future generations, changing you know, technology and allowing more resources. So after the class, after those 10, 20 dives where the instructor's words aren't quite as clear anymore, people can at least refer back to that. And I, I don't know who that you know, really comes down to. Is it the manufacturer that's responsible for putting that information up online? Is it other divers? Is it training agencies? Is it somewhere where a student that is certified can sign into the INTD website or something and say, hey, uh, I kind of forgot how to do this. And they can't get a hold of their instructor. Their instructor's on the other side of the planet. you know, And they're about to go dive. Well, instead of eliminating that kind of experience, you know, can they reference that? I, I'd like to see more of, of online resources for folks. Thank you. And Harry, last comment. Uh, yeah, Richard Harris. Um, just to paraphrase, paraphrase Andrew Fock again, should we be encouraging this um, technology onto newcomers to diving or to the uh, recreational market before we've put our house in order, uh, was his words. And I think that's an important thing for us to stop and think about again. My interest is in, in risk, I guess, and uh, and accidents. I'm not an instructor and obviously I have no um, pecuniary interest in that area and that will be something that the, the training agencies will have to decide whether it's worth their, their time and effort you know, for their business model to do that. But Mark Caney made the point that this will be confined to you know, the first 40 metres of water, the, the units will be specific for that group, they will be made in such a way to have simple responses to problems that arise but I'd remind everyone that we, whilst we understand that the higher risk dives can be the deeper dives and so forth, we also have a lot of divers dying in, on the surface and in very shallow water from human error problems, which will be the same across the board and maybe still higher in a less experienced group. So I, I still would uh, promote a, 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 an attitude of caution. Okay, thank you. I think we've run out of time because we're trying to get back on the rails so that Simon will be able to s sum up this entirely difficult <laughs> afternoon. So thank you, everybody, for your did, comments. Did you notice she called you old a few minutes ago? Yes, yeah, she did she call did. me old. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.